moment, all of whom are here to talk about the not insignificant subject of Crystal's role as a green capital, and how as such it can well help to change the world. They are Bristol's elected mayor, George Ferguson, Helen Browning, CEO of the Soil Association, Richard Cresswell, regional director of the Environment Agency in the Southwest, Robert Asquith, planning director of New World Solutions, Ruth Barden, environmental and catchment strategist at Wessex Water, David Ainsworth, head of the business development team at Siemens Marine Current Turbines Limited, and Malcolm Anderson, environmental advisor to the National Trust. I'll introduce the speakers in turn, and they will each talk for 10 minutes. And then at the end, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions for <coughs> 20 minutes or so. So let's start with George Ferguson. George is Bristol's independent elected mayor. He's also an architect, an entrepreneur, and on occasion, an outspoken environmentalist. Uh, he's also famous for wearing red trousers, which I have to say, he's changed tonight to green. So, George Ferguson. I was more nervous at the decision-making in Nantes on Friday evening than I was when I stood for election as Mayor of Bristol. And I was so because I think that the opportunity that the European Green Capital presents is a huge one for Bristol. And it's a great opportunity for bringing the people of Bristol together. It belongs to us all. I recognise faces in here, people who have made a real difference in the city that have been working, some of you, since the 70s to make a better, healthier city. Now, I know you're not all that old, but I am. And uh, I'm full of admiration for those who grasped this agenda ages ago. I don't think we yet rate as Europe's most sustainable city. Far from it. Why did we win it? I think we won it because we've made huge strides in the past few years. And I want to give real credit to those who started this process. I just stand on their shoulders and happen to be the lucky guy who happened to receive the award on Friday night. And I think now is the time not to share, not just to share this award with those who have been working for it and have been so determined that we get there. I think we're the only city that's applied three times. We wouldn't have applied a fourth time. We'd have just done it. But my goodness, I'm relieved that we got there. So, to my mind, my vision of... Um, okay. <laughs> I'll start again. <laughs> Did you hear me at the back? I think I've got to keep this on for, uh, for um, recording purposes. Um, so to my mind, my vision for Bristol Green Capital is that it doesn't belong to the center, it belongs to the edges, it belongs to every neighborhood. And I want to make quite sure that every neighborhood partnership in this city receives part of that award. So we will find a way of doing that. I want to make quite sure that everybody in this city is able to share their stories. I want a story a day from now until the beginning of 2015. I want an idea a day from now until 2015. That's 500 ideas. And then let's select from those ideas the things that we can actually implement during 2015. Those are the little stories and the little ideas. But also, I think, if European green capital is to mean anything, we've got to make huge strides on the bigger front. It's an opportunity for us to look at the way that we not only save energy in this city, and the jury were impressed that we want to double the European target by 2020 of reducing our energy consumption by 40%, but also about how we generate energy in the city. Let's make quite sure that every community is switched in to the importance of local generation. Let's make quite sure that we use every renewable that we can. Many of you may know that I'm not a great fan of nuclear. I was writing against it, briefing against it in the 80s, way before the time when it was perceived to be really dangerous. 
But it's not about the danger, it's about the way it diverts resources from the common sense and good solutions that worries me. Freiburg is a city that could easily have been European green capital. It started its great green revolution of becoming solar city because it was so opposed to a nuclear power station on its doorstep. A threat sometimes is a huge incentive. It became solar city. Now we're determined to become solar city. And at the end of this week, solar city will be setting up camp on College Green out here. And over the weekend, they will be available to show the possibilities. So that's one of the big things on the energy front. Let's make quite sure that Bristol becomes responsible for keeping its own lights on. That's a big vision. As you know, I'm getting into hot water on transport. But the fact that I'm prepared to do that impressed the jury. The fact that I said that it's absolutely essential that we catch up, we're on a catch up. We are behind many other cities on this front. And we have to ex accept that these measures are not just about carrot, but they also have to be about stick. They have to increase the demand for public transport to make that real jump that we need to, uh, to make sure that we have a city that everybody can move around. And I think what is vitally important is that in a city that has huge and incre increasing and encouraging levels of diversity, that this penetrates the whole population. There isn't, and it's an easy jibe, and I'm not making a jibe, but there isn't a true reflection of the population of Bristol in this room. And to my mind, it's really important that this is adopted by all the cultures and races and colors and creeds in Bristol. And I talk about the creeds because I remember I, I once wrote an article that if, if God had a vote, he would vote green. I meant in those days that it was, I, I'm not sure if the Green Party had even been uh, thought of in this country at the time. But I think it is absolute to my mind that the, the lo looking after our environment must be the absolutely top factor for the well-being of any population. My vision is that we involve the children. If we can involve the children, they learn quicker than us, because there are not many children here. They, are, they don't build up barriers to learning. They, don't, they haven't formed prejudices. They don't drive cars. And if we can infuse the children with the meaning of, of, of a green city, if we can give every one of them a tree to plant, which I'm starting a program now, so that the year six, the top year in every primary school, will be given a tree to plant across the city, the sites being chosen by the schools together with their neighborhood partnerships and the local people. Then we can build a program which we, we, do, we shall do with the Woodland Trust, expressing the importance of that tree to every child. Then they learn by experience. They learn they, they, and, they, and they impress that on their, on their, um, on their parents and their, their relations and their friends. So my vision for a better Bristol is one that is really good for our children, not just good for them, but one that they experience real improvements. Because I have an absolute belief, if you make, a, uh, make a, a city that's good for children now, and I'm not just talking about for children in the future, then we make a city that's good for us all. And lastly, I think my vision for 2015 is that it's a year full of fun and celebration. Because when they made the announcement, I knew we'd won. When they said, when the, when, when the EC commissioner said 
and he was Slovenian and I was worried it might go to Ljubljana. He said, it goes to the city who have expressed a sense of fun. And uh, I knew in our presentation that's what we'd done. And I think it's really important that the environment and all issues about sustainability should be expressed with a sense of fun. Because if we're too po-faced about it, if we're too hair shirt about it, we'll never get people to buy into it. So I want to involve all of you, and I want you to involve everybody you can think of across the city. And let's start telling those stories and having those ideas and make Bristol a city that everybody wants to come to, if not to live, at least to learn from. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, our next speaker is Helen Browning, CEO of the Soil Association. Oh, we've just got a two minute. Ah, my apologies. There's a two minute, There's a two minute video to show. Hello, sir. Excuse me. Hi. Can I just say a big thank you to you for making this a green place by doing your recycling? So we say thanks for taking the train, the path you're paving. Thanks for all the carbon you're saving. We can live without it, so very grateful are we. What would life be without the tree or population of trees? So we say thanks for having your mind, for making this so Sorry, Helen, you now have to follow that as well. Um, so, so, Helen is CEO of the Soil Association. It's the UK's leading uh, charity campaigning for healthy, humane, and sustainable food. Helen runs a 13-acre farm in Wiltshire, which supplies organic meat to multiple retailers. And if that wasn't enough work, the business has also diversified to take on the running of the village pub. Helen is also chair of the Food Ethics Council, as was awarded an OBE in 1998 for services to organic farming. Helen. Thank you very much. Well, it's a very hard act to follow, your mayor. Um, thank you for having us here this evening. Uh, the Soil Association, um, I think, I hope many of you know it, it's a national charity uh, founded in 1946, but we've been based in Bristol uh, since the early 80s, and very proud we are to be here. Um, we have about 120 staff uh, based here and about another 70 around the country, about, uh, including uh, a growing office in Scotland. And uh, we work, let's see if this works, there we go. Uh, we work with just about everybody uh, in the food chain. Uh, we work with farmers, uh, with growers, with millers, with abattoirs, with processors, with caterers, retailers, cooks. And most importantly of all, we work with people who eat food. 
so I hope that includes uh, most people in this room and, um, and elsewhere. And our big aim is to find solutions. Uh, that's our goal in life. Everybody knows what the problems are. Uh, our aim as a charity is to help find the solutions that will enable us to farm more gently, more kindly, uh, in a way that's better for people and better for farm animals. And a lot of the work we do now is about innovation. It's about tackling the challenges uh, that farmers face uh, in farming more sensitively, uh, in caring for the environment. And we're working, uh, we're running a, a, a great series of research projects uh, backed by the Dutch Originals Future Farming Programme, uh, which helps farmers to do their own research and uh, connects them up with research teams in a way that helps them farm better. We've also developed, it's very easy to forget uh, that when we, in all this talk of carbon, that actually a huge amount of our carbon footprint comes from the food that we eat. And uh, our low carbon fool, uh, fool tool that we've developed over the last few years helps farmers reduce their carbon footprint. And I have to mention, as a campaigning membership uh, charity, some of the work we do around uh, engaging with the public uh, to help us make the world a better place. We've run a, uh, a really successful campaign alongside lots of other charities over the last year or two to try and save our bees, our Keep Britain Buzzing campaign. You'll find Abby at the back of the hall tonight um, trying to interest you in taking away some seeds to grow in your gardens to keep our bees happy and healthy. But we've also been trying to stop uh, the use of a, a particular group of chemicals uh, which we know are damaging to bee health. We've been trying to prevent uh, the planning of a very large pig unit, uh, many pigs on concrete in Derbyshire. Um, so our not, in our not In My Banger campaign is another one that you might have heard of. Oh gosh, I forgot to click the thing on. And, uh, and three others, very quickly, we're campaigning to try and increase the interest in organic cotton because so many pesticides in the developing world are used on cotton um, and often used by people who are not protected themselves against those chemicals. We're trying to encourage restaurants to provide a better choice for kids, a healthier choice for kids when they're out to lunch. And we want to make sure that people can uh, buy the food Knowing, what it, know, knowing where it comes from, what production systems uh, it's been grown in through our Labelling Matters campaign. You rarely can see on a pack of meat the kind of farming system that it's come from. But the one big thing I want to talk to you about tonight um, is a project we've been running for five or six years now, funded by the Big Lottery, our Food for Life partnership. And we are so proud of the work that's been done with our partners uh, in now over four and a half thousand schools around England and we've just kicked off a program in Scotland too. And the aim of this program is to transform the lives of children and their communities through eating well, eating together, eating around the table with knives and forks and no flight trays at lunch times in schools. We want to involve them, and we do involve them, in growing food. Because once kids learn to grow, they get really engaged. They start to eat better. They become interested in where their food's coming from. We take them to visit farms so that they actually see firsthand how their food's produced. And as I say, we have now 4,500 schools. That's 20% of the schools in England are now enrolled uh, in the Food for Life programme. And we're serving, well not we're serving, but our caterers and the schools themselves are serving over 660,000 meals a day in over 5,500 schools. And the impact of that programme has been astounding. 45% of parents say that they themselves eat more vegetables as a result of their children uh, being in a Food for Life school. And 28% more children eat their five a day, that great holy grail of all parents. How do I get my kids to eat, a five, eat their five a day? And twice as many primary schools are getting outstanding Ofsted ratings uh, in Food for Life schools. For every pound 
that is spent uh, in Food for Life, uh, the social environment and economic dividend uh, is three times that. So we're really excited by this and we want to stretch it further. And the great news is uh, that uh, the big lottery has agreed two years more funding for the program, not just to continue uh, providing this service to schools and supporting schools on that, on that journey, but also to take the program, this approach, uh, into other settings, into hospitals, into care homes, into universities, into the workplace, everywhere where people have very little choice about what they eat at lunchtime. And we're about to start a pilot uh, working with Age UK in, Bris in Bath and North East, in East Somerset, which is all about uh, helping older people engage with schools and pass on, in the way that grandparents do, uh, some of the knowledge they have about cooking and growing uh, and where food comes from. So that feels really exciting. There's been lots of innovation in this program. There's going to be lots more over the next couple of years. Um, and I know that a lot of the schools in, in Bristol themselves are involved and supportive. And very finally, before I, before I end, uh, also really hot off the press and of real interest to Bristol, I know, is uh, the funding we've just received for sustainable food cities to help support cities uh, who often have loads of stuff going on at a grassroots level, but helping to make sure that that comes together, that it has a coherent voice, that the local authorities are working with the businesses, are working with the communities to make the most of all the energy that's happening on the ground and to make sure that, uh, that cities have a real uh, agenda and program for change. Because of all the things we do in this world, eating is the thing we do every day. And food is the way uh, into many people's hearts and minds. Food is where it's easiest to start sometimes in becoming greener. And so it's great to be in Bristol. Uh, it's great that Bristol has been so much part of the innovation, uh, both with the Soil Association and in so many other places. Um, and I know that Bristol is going to be at the forefront of our move into more sustainable food cities. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Next up is Richard Cresswell, the Regional Director of the Environment Agency in the southwest of England. Richard is a zoology graduate with a research doctorate in applied hydrobiology. He's a former chairman of Sustainability Southwest and chair of Future Foundations, which promotes sustainable construction. He's also chair of Homemaker Southwest, a charity which aims to tackle homelessness by helping vulnerable people to build and maintain their homes. Richard received an MBE in July 2000 for services to the environment. Richard. Thank you very much and uh, I too am very pleased to be in Bristol tonight and uh, many congratulations to, uh, to Bristol for being uh, accepted as the, as the green capital in 2015. Um, it is uh, great to be in Bristol because our head office of the Environment Agency is actually in Bristol. Uh, I can see it through the windows here just beside uh, the council house here. Uh, I'm very proud of that building because it is one of the most uh, environmentally friendly buildings in the country. And it is good for an environmental organisation to have uh, a head office like that because it makes me feel good about that uh, and, and at home. And I, and I say that because I think it's important for everybody to feel at home in their locality. It's important for the people of Bristol to feel at home uh, with their locality and at home with their environment. And so linking that, uh, I, I'm going to be talking tonight about how do we improve uh, the water environment in uh, Bristol and in other parts of the country. It is a new approach. Uh, it was launched by uh, the Minister on the 4th of June, uh, so not long ago. It is an approach that involves everybody. It was piloted in Bristol over a year ago and there's been uh, great progress and as a result of, of those pilots it's now being rolled out across the whole country. But 
when people think about their river, they think about the bit that's closest to their house or the closest to their, to their um, office or whatever. And of course, that little bit is just part of a catchment. And what happens upstream in a river may well uh, have great effects on downstream. So for instance, if people in the, in the uplands uh, behave in a certain way, it can make water run off very quickly and cause flooding in a place like Bristol. Downstream, if we don't look at how we control the tides, particularly for Bristol, then eventually with sea level rise, Bristol can be a threat, hence the talk of a tidal barrier for Bristol. So this is a big, complicated matter, um, and it is important that we listen to, to, the, to, the, to the community about what they want. It is important to listen to their evidence about what is right and what is wrong with their local water environment. And it is important to involve them both in the solutions and the actions to put it right. This is the Bristol Avon catchment. I was amazed to, 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 to see that it's over 2,000 square miles because people just see uh, a small part of it. A population of a million people live in this catchment. The water quality is generally good, but as always with, with Europe, and this is one of the good or bad things, they're always changing how you monitor things. The water quality is good, but the ecological status, the fish and the plants and animals that live in it are not as good as they should be. And in fact, only 24% of the Bristol Avon catchment is a good status. You might think, well, what's the rest of the country? The rest of the country isn't much better, I have to say, only 26%. But this is not good enough. A lot of the things that, that are a problem are things like phosphate, uh, which enrich the waters too much, and fish habitat, and, and obstructions to fish passage. But the river is very different. Parts of the, the river, the Froome, uh, is a very rural type of catchment. Very different to the Brislington Brook. And again, you can see why there would be concerns about the habitat. But those of you who know Bristol well will know that the River Froome, which had that rural, idle uh, look in the slide ago, uh, flows under Bristol in, in a massive culvert. And those of you who may have tried to post a letter in the black pet le letter boxes and wondered why there isn't a slot in it, it's because it is, the, it is the entrance down into the culvert. So your letter would go uh, in the wrong place. And indeed, making it even more complicated, uh, Wessex Water um, her own and maintain uh, more than one big interceptor uh, going and taking water across the, this one across the north of Bristol and, and making sure that the water is away from the urban centre. But for most of you, it's this site, it's the floating harbour, it's the, it's the way that the, the good water quality in the city centre and the vision of the city of Bristol have actually made the, the waterfront a really vibrant economy. But what's happening beneath the water? And that's what we need to, to look at now. Are the fish thriving? Are the uh, invertebrates thriving? Are the plants thriving? And is the habitat good? It's not good enough. So we need to look at things like this, about farm runoff upstream, look at land management, look at the discharges uh, from sewage works, see if we can get the uh, amount of phosphate down. We need to improve habitat and we need to improve fish passage. At the top right there, for those of you who've got good eyesight, you can see a little tiny eel going up the plastic grass and this is a way of getting eels up some of our impassable weirs. But this has got to be delivered in partnership because it's a massive catchment and there are so many different aspects of it. You'll see here that the steering group that was set up over a year ago involves the local authorities, the, the Avon Froome Partnership, the Wildlife Trust, the Rivers Trust, Wessex Water ourselves and many others. And going forward, it could cost millions to do some of the things and I'm sure Wessex Water will be investing millions in some of those things. But it is not just big millions, it's not just big money, it's about small things that people can do to improve their own little bit of the environment and, 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 and if they want to. It's not just big organisations, it's the friends of who can really help. 
And it's their enthusiasm that will take this forward and it will be local action. And it is about all parts of the catchment. The Bristol Avon group have had a very good start. Such a good start that those pilots have actually encouraged uh, government to roll this out across the whole country, 80 more catchments. But the success will actually uh, involve, need real involvement, determination, as your mayor was talking about, right the way across the board. I hope that the people of this city and the people in the broader Avon catchment will engage and will help to start the improvements in the water environment for this city that they and the green capital deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, our next speaker is Robert Asquith. Robert is Planning Director of New Earth Solutions, a company which provides waste treatment and composting services to local authorities and has a treatment plant near Bristol. He's a geographer with a diploma in urban planning and worked for 16 years as a planning consultant. Robert is a recognised expert in the field of securing planning consents and authorisations for major energy from waste developments as well as providing support to tendering activities. Robert. Thank you very much. Right, if I press that, what happens? <coughs> oh, we're off. I think, yes, we're off. So this is two, this is a five minute loop. Uh, so when it's been through twice, uh, I'll, I'll shut up. Um, okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, particularly on this auspicious occasion of Bristol having just uh, gained uh, the Green Capital uh, Prize, which is fantastic. Um, I'm here to talk to you about what we do down at Avonmouth, um, or up at Avonmouth, uh, which is about three miles from here, uh, and in, in Bristol uh, City Council's area. And uh, what we do at Avonmouth is that we manage residual waste. Well, what you'll see on the loop is various images of residual waste being managed by us. And it's your waste. It comes from Bristol. It comes from uh, the wider west of England area, which includes Bath, North East Somerset, and South Gloucestershire. And what is residual waste? Well, I'm sure I'm not talking to a representative selection of people here, because I'm sure you're all brilliant recyclers, and you all have one of those medals uh, that were given out. Uh, but um, sadly, a lot of people still t put a lot of waste in their residual bin. And even if you're a brilliant recycler, I'm sure you still have something that probably leaves the house uh, in a black sack. That comes to us. And our story really with Bristol has been going on for 10 or more years. Uh, but it started uh, in earnest in July 2009, four years ago, uh, when we were awarded preferred bidder status for a contract to handle residual waste from the west of England. Um, so um, since July 2009, and it's now nearly four years on, we're pretty pleased with the progress we've made. Uh, we've uh, built an 11-acre site down at Avonmouth. Uh, we've built about 20,000 square feet of buildings. We've put over 70 machines in those buildings that do various things to your rubbish. Um, and we also employ about 80-odd people there's two main facets to it. There's a waste uh, management facility and then an energy management facility that takes some of the material that we produce out of the waste. Um, we employ about 80 people between those two facilities. Uh, the waste plant is running 24 hours a day, five and a half days a week, and the energy plant is now running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so since uh, July 2009, uh, we started receiving waste uh, in April 2011. Throughout the rest of 11, we built out and commissioned the rest of the waste treatment plant. Uh, and then through 12 and now into 13, we've been building our pyrolysis and gasification plant, which makes uh, electricity from some of the, uh, the, the waste material. We've got basically machines that are producing four different strands of waste, of material out of your waste. Um, we produce uh, what we call a second chance recycling. So there's metal and there's plastic uh, in, in the rubbish. When we get that out and we can sell that off to the recycling uh, sector. 
We produce a land remediation compost, a brown, humic material that gets used um, on restoring quarries um, and uh, producing golf courses. Um, it basically is used for anything that requires where plants are going to grow, but you're not going to eat those plants. Uh, because, uh, unfortunately, people do put things in their bins which you wouldn't want to end up in your iceberg lettuce. So, um, for ecology, it's great. For golf, it's great. It's a shame you can't eat golf courses, in my opinion, but anyway. Um, we produce, um, the third product we produce is, is thin air. That's a great product, because when you compost waste, an awful lot of it just turns into thin air. And for us, that's a fantastic uh, output. And then the final product we produce is a refuse-derived fuel, which is a uh, renewable fuel uh, because we've taken the plastic out. Uh, so it is made of what used to be plants or animals, um, food, um, cardboard, wood, paper, wool, cotton, leather, large fruit and veg. They end up uh, in our renewable fuel fraction um, and that is what then goes through to our pyrolysis and gasification plant, which I'll talk about in a second. How did this start for New Earth? Um, well, uh, 10 or more years ago, our founder owned a landfill site. He realized that landfill was not an industry or a business sector that had a great future, um, not least of which because eventually a landfill site does actually fill up. But it was also obviously going somewhat out of fashion with the direction of travel of European and national policy on the environment. What he also realized was that the acknowledged orthodoxy is if you don't bury waste, you burn it. And um, apart from what else you might think of incinerators, um, there's a real practical problem if you're a, a family-owned landfill business, which is that they cost about £150 million pounds, and you need a 25-year contract from a council to be able to supply the waste to, to make it work. So a journey was gone on, a, a metaphorical journey and a, a physical journey was gone, around, gone on to look around the world at ways of handling waste. And this concluded initially with a decision to go into composting in quite a big way. And I've got to say that it's about this point that the relationship with Bristol started because although we were doing this down in Dorset, um, we were bringing material from Bristol to do it because not every council shared uh, our vision. Um, and we composted green waste initially, quite successfully, sent it out to farms, got a Soil, Accredit Soil Association accreditation for that. Um, and then being um, curious folk, we decided to see what would happen if you composted black bag residual waste. And the answer is it composts, and at the end of the process, you've got about 30% less than you had at the start of the process. Well, back in the dark ages of waste management, about five, six years ago, that was a brilliant result. Uh, because then the name of the game was to get biological material out of landfill. So getting a 30% reduction without an incinerator was actually quite an achievement. But we went on from that and we started looking at machines to sort through the material. And I'm pleased to say that although we handle over 200,000 tonnes a year of waste at Avonmouth at the moment, um, all of the sorting is done by machine with the exception of one single job We've got one person in that plant who actually is physically pulling bits of waste away from recycling material. And that's kind of the exception that proves the rule. You can automate all this. By the way, we have no shortage of people wanting that job, uh, interestingly enough. Um, so um, we um, produce um, a, a, a refuse dry fuel um, out of this uh, material. Um, and then we, we started a few years ago, three or four years ago now, looking at techniques and technologies for turning that fuel into something useful. Uh, that something useful has turned out to be electricity, but it isn't necessarily that that's where we think the end of the story is, uh, and our technology is very much a, a, a transition technology towards hopefully a much better future even than that. So this fuel is sort of fluffy stuff. It's... Uh, it's uh, organic, it's, it's a biomass material, um, and it would be a waste of money to put it into an incinerator, because incinerators are incredibly robust, they have to take engine blocks and tree trunks. But we haven't got those because we take those out at the front end of our waste plant, so we can afford to have something which is more sophisticated, and we've got pyrolysis and gasification technology, which produces a gas. 
And the government subsidizes us to do that through the renewables obligation because we're producing renewable electricity, but also because that gas ultimately has a whole host of other things that could happen to it. It could be turned into hydrogen, into methane, road fuel, aviation fuel. It could be turned into uh, raw materials for plastic manufacturing. So we're a gateway technology, which is why we qualify under the renewables obligation just as much as the fact that we produce renewable energy. So here we are four years after we started. We're now um, fully operational on line one of our pyrolysis and gasification plants, and we're fully operational on our waste plant. We're looking to the future. Um, the big waste management companies are somewhat uh, suffering from inertia. Um, and so it's taking them a while to take notice of what we're doing, but we think that shortly they'll start forming an orderly queue, which will be great for Bristol, because not only is Bristol benefiting from this 95% diversion from landfill and from this 13 megawatts of electricity, enough for 25,000 houses, but also all of our design team, all of our engineering team are based here. This was invented here, and it shows what this city can do um, and I think it's important to underline that in our business you get nowhere without the waste. The council controls the waste. The councils have shown faith uh, and uh, hope in what we've done. Um, so we're building a low energy industry here in Bristol um, with the support of the city council and the other local authorities. And I think that's partly why this city is now going to be the green capital of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Robert. Next we have Ruth Barden, um, who is the environmental and catchment strategist at Wessex Water. After completing an MSc in environmental waste management, Ruth worked for Anglian Water and Ofwat before joining Wessex Water in 2003, where she was responsible for carrying out environmental impact assessments for construction work projects. Ruth now heads up the environment and catchment strategy team leading on water framework directive planning and implementation. Ruth. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also going to be focusing on the waste theme, I'm afraid, and that's actually some way into the presentation, so a bit of a sneak preview for you there. Um, so a different view of Bristol. This is our sewage treatment works at Avonmouth. It's the largest sewage treatment works within the Wessex Water area, taking the waste from about a million people around Bristol. Um, but it's not so much a sewage treatment works as an energy generation factory as well. So I won't dwell on, on Wessex Water's uh, area because we're in Bristol and your water here is provided by Bristol. We just take your waste. As, a, as an industry, and certainly as a company, we face a number of challenges. Um, Richard mentioned many of the water quality issues in the area. Um, European legislation strives for us to have an environment which can support ecology of in near pristine conditions. Um, de depends on your definition of pristine conditions, given sort of industrial revolution and things like that. Um, but that faces, poses problems for a water industry, what we need to do to our sewage, sewage before it can be discharged into the environment. The same legislation also requires that river flows are relatively unaltered and that wetlands are enhanced, but we still need to provide water for a changing population. We have carbon dioxide targets which we need to meet, and also an ageing infrastructure which needs to be maintained with minimal disruption to the, the cities and people who occupy them. Overall, we need to provide a faultless service guaranteeing good quality and safe drinking water and to remove and treat waste that we all produce without rising water bills. We need to be out of sight and out of mind. But in order to address these, we have no option but to innovate. And we don't just mean sort of developing new technologies, whizzy gadgets and gizmos, things like that. We also need to look at how we can best use low tech solutions and also um, optimize our existing systems. We have a lot of energy intensive plant. This is a nitrate removal plant, um, which takes removes nitrate from drinking water before it's provided to our customers. This is on the, on the sewage side. We, um, we, we Basically, sewage treatment is a biological process, but in order to, to 
treat the waste, we need to optimise those biological processes to provide the right amount of air and food and, and temperature. A lot of that takes energy and a lot of pumping. You can see there sort of lots of pipes and pumps which are, are required to inject the oxygen into that, that system. So it's not surprising, really, that our electricity consumption has, has been rising um, up until the point where we got to 2007, and actually we needed to really start thinking about things, given that the direction of regulation was, go was pushing us into ever tighter standards and thus more, in more intensive treatment um, solutions. So part of our work has been very much looking to optimise our existing systems, uh, looking at increasing use of instrumentation to provide those optimal conditions for the bacteria essentially to do, do our work for us, looking at um, solids monitors and things like that when we're decanting sludge so that we make sure we get it at just the right thickness, which is about the equivalent to a sort of McDonald's chocolate milkshake, that sort of thing. Looking at more energy efficient plants, motors and the panels which we use. And again, at our, our ultraviolet disinfection plants, this is where we, we tr remove the bacteria, treat the bacteria um, before it's just, the waste is discharged upstream of sort of beaches. We've been having a program of replacing the light bulbs to make them a bit more energy efficient, very similar to the, to the work which people do in their homes. And this work over about the last six years has saved us um, 53 gigawatts and about 4.5 million pounds off our energy bill. There are also other techniques which we can use, not actually installing any treatment plants. Our catchment management work is very much looking at this. The way in which the land is managed often determines the quality of surface and groundwaters. So by focusing on land management, we can possibly prevent a problem from happening, meaning that we don't need to install this end of pipe treatment plant. So the nitrate removal plant, which I showed, there, in some cases, there's no need for that. We, we were the first water company to offer sort of this service to, to our, our um, land managers on areas of land which we didn't own. And the service we provide is very much looking at very focused agronomic advice, looking at the inputs which farmers put on their land, the, providing real data on the quality of their soil, the level of nutrients applied, providing, providing advice on cover crops and subsidising for changing practices or chemicals. All of this is very people intensive and you build a very good relationship up with the farmers in our area and has led to a, an avoidance of installing treatment plants. It also costs us less money and if it costs us less money, money it costs you less money. It's about a sixth of the cost of a new treatment plant. But there are also wider environmental benefits, not only the carbon dioxide reduction but also increased biodiversity and environmental gains. Another side of our work is really then focusing on the, the options for renewable energy generation. And part, we have a subsidiary company called Genico, which is an award-winning company focusing on recycling and renewable energy generation. A lot of their work is, is really focused at Avonmouth, at our largest sewage treatment works. Um, and and they have, uh, there's anaerobic digestion there, which is, is used as a way to, to create biogas, much as the way that Robert sort of described earlier. Um, and the biogas which we produce can be cleaned up and used to produce energy and heat for our combined heat and power engines, or also to provide fuel for our biobug, which is one of the first poo-powered cars. The site at Avonmouth produces 18 million tonnes of biogas and about 300, uh, sorry, 30 gigawatts of energy. As a company, we produce 19% of our total energy demand through renewable sources, which equates to about 46 gigawatts. So clearly this is a, an increasing area for us and something which we're very keen to focus on. We've recently um, opened our, our food waste recycling facility. This is the first one um, in Bristol and also the first one in the country which has been co-located on the sewage treatment works. It's got the capacity to take up to 40,000 tonnes of food waste and that's receiving waste from local authorities, so the doorstop collections which you get, from restaurants, supermarkets um, and sort of uh, I guess food which has expired. Um, so really it is looking at, at the sewage treatment works more as an energy generation factory rather than just your traditional sewage treatment facility. But that's not the only sort of innovation and investment which we've, we've had in the Bristol area. Since 1995 we've invested £335 million improving our sewage, sewage and sludge treatment facilities in and around Bristol to counter sort of the um, in European environmental legislation and to improve water quality. 
and we have seen improvements in water quality in the River Avon and Severn Estuary. A lot of this work is pretty big scale. One of our flagship engineering projects recently completed is the Bristol Tunnel. This is a £9.5 million project to reduce sewer flooding in central Bristol. That's right in the centre of Bristol. We constructed an 800 metre long tunnel, which is 65 metres below the city centre. And it required some quite innovative techniques, um, mainly using explosions. There were more than 500 controlled explosions to get through rock, which is 12 times stronger than concrete. And miraculously, we didn't get any complaints during this blasting. And this, is, this sort of innovation here is really representative of the way the company is working and the challenges we have to face. This new tunnel, it links a Victorian sewer with a sewer which was constructed in the 1990s to take flows away to Avonmouth for treatment and obviously to produce energy. As a result of this, there's been improved customer service and reduction of flooding in central Bristol. There's been a reduction in the number of storm spills from overflows into the River Avon, improving water quality. But what can you see for all of this investment for £9.5 million? I think there are four manholes in front of the Hippodrome. So for centuries, cities have really turned their backs on their rivers. These were areas of heavy industry, transport, and often open sewers. Within the Wessex Water region, sewers have discharged millions of gallons of untreated waste on a daily basis into the River Avon. But this is changing, and it has changed dramatically with the recent investment which we've made. And now, domestic, cultural, and social developments are along rivers and harbours, and land is often at a premium. There are known water quality, no, sorry, quality of life benefits from water, access to open spaces, exercise, and the fact that water can, can help with stress relief. So water quality in Bristol has improved to enable wildlife such as otters to appear in the, in the floating harbour and fish populations to increase. But there is still more to do. And as a company, we've got aspirations to deliver those changes and innovations and really work with Bristol to create a very vibrant and environmentally focused city. Thank you. ...involved in designing hydraulic systems and components for numerous European aircraft programmes, as well as gas turbine systems for various target drones, European military aircraft and missile programmes. David joined MCT in 2003 and has been responsible for programme management, project development, consenting and grant applications and administration. David. Um, thank you for the intro introduction. It starts to make me feel a bit old now doing things for 25 years. Um, so firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the, Green, um, the Big Green Week to actually, uh, for this opportunity to, to uh, present to you. And uh, secondly, I would like to congratulate Bristol on the... Um, the 2015 accolade, which is a, a really big mark for uh, Bristol. Um, so, uh, what I wanted to talk about today is not necessarily um, the um, CGM project in Strangford Lock, but why Bristol is so influential, influential in the tidal sector. Um, because whether you, um, not many pro people probably realise it, that Bristol is the home to two of the world's leading tidal technology development companies. That's Siemens Marine Current Turbines and the um, Ulstom Tidal Generation. But also within Bristol, there are a lot of other contractors who are actually, and specialists who are actually involved in this sector. The picture you can see here is the uh, 1.2 megawatt tidal turbine, which has been deployed in Strangford Lock in Northern Ireland since 2008. Uh, a lot of the components on the device were actually assembled and tested within Bristol. It was totally designed uh, and conceived within Bristol, um, so the team here is very much wedded to the area. Um, Marine Current Turbines has basically been located in Bristol since 2004, and prior to that it was in um, Basingstoke in Hampshire. So, um, Bristol has a long relationship with the sea, and has for many, many years understood the uh, limitations of tidal um, tidal rise and fall. I mean, this is typically the entrance to Belfast to move into Bristol Harbour. And the navigators two centuries ago knew pretty well how to navigate at that and how to actually predict the tides so they could actually get into the lock um, and into the harbour itself. And tidal technology very much draws on this experience. We can actually use the phases of the moon and the predictions of the moon to actually predict how much tidal energy we can actually extract at any one particular time. 
So unlike other forms of renewable, if people come to us and say, how much energy can you generate at 6 o'clock on the 31st of June 2016, wind can't tell you that, solar can't tell you that, but tidal can. It is totally predictable within a small area margin. So that's one of the benefits that we have above um, other forms of renewables. And the global market for tidal technology is pretty significant. Uh, and there are estimates which basically suggest that there's something like around 300 gigawatt hours of electricity from tidal um, throughout the world. Um, and the global market includes France, Canada, New Zealand, Korea, Japan, China, USA, India, Chile, and many, many other countries as we, as we move forward. And Siemens and the marine currents turbines vision is that that market will be addressed from our facilities within Bristol. Right. Um, so, um, so this gives you an idea of basically the force of the tides around Strangford um, and around tur the turbines, which actually drive this, um, which actually drive the turbines to generate electricity. And as you can see, there's a, a significant ramp between the, the front and the back. In Strangford, we typically see currents of around eight or nine knots. But um, in re reality, tidal, tidal races around five or six knots are sufficient for our requirements. So um, why has Bristol become such a significant player in the tidal sector? And this just gives you an idea of the key players within Bristol who are involved in this area. And for some clever reason, the uh, software here is actually filtering our, our logo on the top left-hand side. <laughs> But on the top right hand side you have Tidal Generation which is an Alston company and uh, as I said uh, MCT and Alston uh, TGL are two of the leading device developers in the world. There are three or four others who are based in places like Austria, China and other places but we're the best. <laughs> um, I was talking to a colleague this morning at Renewable UK to see if he could actually give me an estimate of the number of employees working in the tidal sector in the UK. He only has combined figures for what he thinks are involved in the wave and tidal sector. And his estimate is something like around 1,500 in the wave and tidal. We know that, the, um, we know that there are more people working in wave in the UK because there are quite a few technology development companies up in um, Scotland. So we estimate that maybe there's around 500 in the UK working solely on tidal. And of that, there's probably a good 40 to 45% of them based in the Bristol and Southwest area. So we have a very, very, very strong cluster around Bristol involved in this technology, in this area. So how did this all start? Um, well, I think, I like to think it was basically, it's been driven by MCT's presence. MCT, um, not present in the top left. Um, <laughs> We were basically, we were uh, um, a company which, which span out of this other company in the middle here, IT Power. And IT Power were based in Basingstoke um, back, at the, back in the turn of the century. And our then technical director was an employee at IT Power. And he basically decided that he wanted to push tidal technology further than IT Power wanted to. So he created a business, Marine Current Turbines, and took all the IP out of IT Power to actually take that business forward. That business actually worked with a collaboration of engineers, including W.S. Atkins, um, based at the Aztec West Science Park, um, to actually develop this device, which is Seaflow, which is de deployed in Limith in 2003. Um, well, after Seaflow had been installed, MCT met critical, met critical mass. We actually had quite a lot of investment and quite a lot of funding, and the employees from Atkins decided that they wanted to join MCT full-time. So they did, but the only prerequisite on that was that they didn't have to move away from Basingstoke, no, sorry, away from Bristol. So basically Basingstoke came to Bristol, and that's why MCT is located in Bristol. Um, move on a couple of years, and a couple of the engineers employed at MCT decided that what MCT was doing didn't quite align with what they thought the best technology solution was. So they moved, moved forward and actually set up another business called Tidal Generation. Tidal Generation ultimately became owned by um, Rolls-Royce, and Rolls-Royce actually sold that division of the company to Alstom in 2012. So that's why you actually have two tidal businesses within Bristol. But then IT Power decided that maybe the center of the universe of tidal wasn't in Basingstoke and they should be in Bristol, so they moved their business to Bristol as well. 
And then you actually have all this uh, other network of um, consultants in the area, Atkins, Fraser and Nash just across the green here, and a few others to name a few, who actually provide a very good network of services. So, um, so when Siemens fully acquired MCT in 2013, they moved us out of a nice little um, building right next to Bristol Parkway, which uh, I think there were 35 of us squeezed into an office space which was designed for about 15. And they moved us into this very nice office park up in Bristol and Barks Science Park. And I'd like to challenge Richard here. I think this is the most environmentally friendly building in the office park. <laughs> this, it's, it's an incredibly nice facility. We have solar panel, we have um, ground heat storage pumps, um, absolutely everything you can think of. And it's basically, um, it's achieved what they call BREAM excellent status, which is the world's leading design assessment methodology for sustainable buildings. And it's a very nice working environment. I think it's very um, creative. And the whole lot of the MCT workforce, which I think is probably 45 full-time people and about 10 consultants, uh, really vibrate here and really get on with the work. So, um, so what next? Where do we go from here? Um, we're still developing new technology. Uh, in April this year, we had Ed Davey visited our new facility in St. Phillips. We took on an ex-Babcock factory in St. Phillips um, and we fitted it out to basically build tidal turbines for the next 10 or 15 years in Bristol. And um, so this is uh, Ed Davey talking to our engineering director with the model of CGEN and these are some of the components which are actually going through um, the factory at the moment. Um, so St. Phillips is big enough to meet, meet our demands for the next 10 or 15 years um, and we will actually it's basically export to the world from the St. Phillips factory. Uh, within the UK alone, there is believed to be something like around um, 20 gigawatts of installed tidal capacity. Some estimates are higher, some estimates are lower. But that's enough for us to actually build quite a significant business on in the UK. The current estate has so far granted leases for around 1.3 gigawatts, gigawatts of uh, tidal technology. And this will be developed over the next 10 to 15 years. Our next projects basically are two small arrays. By 2016, there should be four tidal arrays operational in the UK. Two of them will be belong to um, MCT, um, Siemens, and two of them will belong to our competitors. Those four are the Inner Sound in uh, Stroma up in Scotland, which is a 10 megawatt array de being developed by Magem, and a 10 megawatt array in the Sound of Isla, which has been developed by Scottish Power. And both of those arrays use a technology manufactured by a company called Andritz in Austria. So they won't be using UK technology. Um, but our two, our two arrays, basically, this is the Scaries and Anglesey. Um, so this is a 10 megawatt array, which hopefully should be deployed in 2005, 2016. It looks very picturesque, but just to the right here is a big nuclear power station, so it's, um, which, will be, which has been decommissioned at the moment. And that's the Scaries Lighthouse. And then the next one is four two megawatt devices in Kyle Ray, which is the race between Sky and the mainland in Scotland. So um, in summary, um, I think Bristol basically has given us the right, um, it's, it's given us the right environment, it's given us the right office space, it's given us the right calibre of staff, and it's an attractive place to actually bring people to actually work. We actually have people from all nationalities. We have Welsh, we have Scottish, um, I think. <laughs> Uh, we, are, we have uh, Italians working for us, and people have actually re relocated to Bristol to come and work for us. People from Southampton, I see Pascal down there, and Scott from, um, Scott from Edinburgh. So it's a very attractive place to actually bring people who are very energetic and enthusiastic about their work. Um, and I think basically Bristol is actually recognised for its centre of excellence, its centre of capabilities for the tidal sector. So uh, let's say wrap, up, wrap up and say thank you very much, and uh, I hope that explains why there is so much tidal activity within Bristol itself. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we're now moving to our <coughs> final speaker, and please remember that you'll have the opportunity to ask questions of the, any of the panel members after uh, David's, uh, uh, Malcolm has spoken. So um, if you want to think of some questions, do so now. Um, Malcolm Anderson is an environment, environmental advisor within the South West region of the National Trust. He provides technical advice to staff at the Trust's historic houses in order to help reduce their energy and water consumption. 
generate renewable energy, adapt to a changing climate, and broadly reduce the environmental impact of their activities. Malcolm. Hi. Um, I managed to get the graveyard shift, so I'm going to try and wake you up with some pretty pictures. Um, National Trust, you know, everybody knows the National Trust. It's a nice fluffy feeling. Tinsfield here, beautiful building. We own lots of buildings. We also own lots of landscape. We own lots of countryside. We look after lots of coastline, all sorts of co coastline all around the UK. But big question is why am I here in Bristol talking to you? It's not an existentialist crisis. It's a serious question about, you know, what am I actually doing standing in front of you? Well, the National Trust was actually set up in, oh, look, I have to look here to check, it's 1895 by some Victorian philanthropists. And it wasn't set up to own stately homes. It wasn't set up to sell scones. It wasn't set up to look after some of the areas that we currently think about the National Trust doing. It was actually quite a reactionary organisation. It was a campaigning organisation that was set up to challenge the industrialisation that was taking place in the UK at the time. And it was about this thing that actually they believed passionately that people in cities needed green space and they needed to be able to breathe fresh air and to be sustained by their environment. Now we talk a lot about sustainability, but actually it goes the other way as well in that we need to be sustained by our environment as much as we need to help the environment in that way. But Again, it's, it's that question about what am I talking about? We talk about sustainability, the National Trust. There's all manner of things that come under that sustainability umbrella. I could be here talking about our real concern about over-abstraction of groundwater sources. I could be here talking about our real passion about getting children engaged with nature and the importance of bringing the people that live and work in cities out onto the estates that are on the fringes of it, so places like Tinsfield and things. But one of the things that is of a real immediate concern to us is climate change. Now, climate change, I could bore you with statistics and data and all those sorts of things that everybody does when they talk about climate change, but the reality of climate change to us in the National Trust is that our experience and our own data inside the Trust is showing that these events are happening more and more and more. They're happening more seriously and they're happening more frequently. So we get flash flood events, Bosco there. We've got serious issues with drought causing cracking and, and sort of shrinkage. We've got serious surface water flooding problems. This is the vine in Hampshire. Um, and we're having to assess our parkland and things for damage, potential damage through wind. So most of our properties are now closed if the winds go over sort of 30 miles an hour because we're having to look seriously at what happens to these places with the countryside. The irony of the Land Rover being crushed by the tree, I'm not mentioning anything, but as a, as a large landowner as well, we, an owner of the coastline, um, we have to also look at issues such as coastal erosion, which is rapidly increasing in certain parts of the country. Um, and it's not so much the fact that the coast is eroding, because actually we're quite okay with that as an organisation. Um, you know, we can manage and we can do a managed retreat and we can actually accept these natural processes taking place. But the issue, if you look in the bottom of the picture, is how you have fixed infrastructure interacting with a natural process. So how do you manage people's houses that are in the way of a retreating coastline? How do you manage a sewage treatment works? How do you manage an electrical substation? All of these things are there as part of our, of part of our ownership. Um, but climate change, and I'm, I'm deliberately not using the global warming word, um, but climate change is a, it's a very big, very global issue. Um, you know, why are the National Trust so impacted? And I was really interested to see in the, in the Independent today a report on a, on a pu publication that's come out talking about what the local impacts of climate change abroad will be. And actually, I think that's where the National Trust are coming from. It's, yes, we have impacts on our own buildings and on our own landscape and things like that, but actually it's the knock-on effects of what's going to happen elsewhere that are as important to us as that. But climate change, you know, we are going to be impacted on it, but climate change is, is one issue there. The, the real things that tie into that climate change are around resource scarcity. So whether we talk about oil, um, the ability for people to fight and kill over the access to oil, whether we talk about water, and the ability for people to fight and kill over access to water. 
Um, they're all things that tie us as an organisation into the future. When we were set up, it took six acts of parliament to set the, set the National Trust up. And most of our land, not all of it, but most of the land that we look after can't be sold. We can't go bust. We have to look after it forever. There's no retreat policy in terms of our ownership. So things like resource scarcity, what happens if the lights go out? What happens if we run out of water? Let's look in the southeast of England at our ownership and think about the fact that they might just have no water to sustain the gardens that are currently there. These things are internationally important, but we need to plan for that change. Um, so climate change, I'm, you know, I'm rattling through things because it's only 10 minutes, but uh, we, we have to do something and we have to start somewhere. Um, so we are looking at working on food production. We are looking at working on, on catchment management things on our land holdings for water. We're working with children, um, but we are doing a lot of work on energy. And actually, the reality of working on energy or water, um, when you look at an estate, whether that estate be a city or a house or a country estate like a lot of ours are, the reality of it is a lot of peering in holes in the ground. Um, it's a lot of dusty basements, it's attics, it's spiders and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but you've got to understand what you've got. Um, and for an organisation the size of ours, it's actually very difficult to start understanding what you've got. And the parallels between us as an organisation and a city are actually really strong because actually a big chunk of this is about understanding what is there, what is in the city, how do things work. And you've got so many stakeholders that own different bits of it. Pulling that together as a cohesive strategy for a whole city could be very difficult. But once we've understood it, you know, we can get on with the pretty basic things. You know, we can do our insulation. Um, anybody can do that in their own house. You can do that in any building, really. Even in our hard-to-treat homes, as, as the technical jargon calls us. But once you've done the basics, and by basics I mean looking at your drafts. Nobody built a house 400 years ago with leaky windows. That's 400 years of wear and tear and shrinking and cracking and movement creates gaps, creates drafts. So take care of them. Maintenance is, is absolutely essential. And then once we've done some of the basics, we, we take another step on in terms of energy and we start looking at LED light bulbs. Now, everyone always told us you couldn't have an LED light bulb in, a chand in chandeliers or candelabras. And so what we did is work with manufacturers to make them. Um, and that's something that the benefit that comes from being a, a very large organization. Um, the thing about our organization is actually that we're nothing more than a collection of SMEs because every single one of our properties is run in effect as a standalone business unit. So really what we're doing here and working with manufacturers to get what we want is no different to something that a city could do. And then we get on to the big things, you know, the big sexy turbines and biomass boilers and things like that, things that cost lots of money and get lots of people awards. But actually, you know, this stuff is just a technology. It's just something you plug in, you take an oil boiler out, you plug a biomass boiler in and you get your fuel from somewhere. The thing for us and the challenge for us has been about actually finding out where we can get the fuel from. So whether we can supply it ourselves, whether we can look at hydro, whether we can look at things that are landscape appropriate. And the National Trust, you'll see us in debates about wind turbines. You might see our chairman say other things, but you'll see us say things about wind turbines that they have to be in the right place. That's all we're, all we're concerned about. But you'll see the technologies being used where we consider to be the right place. And the fuel supply issue, um, this is Sudbury, but Tinsfield has a large, two large biomass boilers just on the outskirts of Bristol here. Um, I've been in Durham all day looking at a uh, biomass boiler system for Durham Park. Um, you know, we are slowly but surely ticking off these, these big lumps, you know, um, as we go. But for Tinsfield, we actively are looking at Lee Woods, we're looking at Newark Park, we're all these areas that are managed as woodland. And the idea really is not just about us supplying ourselves, it's our relevance to a city, to cities and communities, not just Bristol in terms of where our relevance is as an energy provider, perhaps, as a water provider in some places, because of the, the, the management of the land that we've got. Who knows? The future has lots of things in it. Um, but as I said, you can stick a technology in any way. You know, anybody can change a light bulb. Anybody can do that. But really, the, the real challenge is about behavioral change. And it's about people's attitudes. And it's about people actually turning stuff off. 
and people understanding the pounds and pence that's involved in actually doing an action. Um, and that is the hard bit. Um, internally within the trust, uh, we are actively trying to change people's behaviours. And you'd think in an organisation like the National Trust, that would be easy. People are passionate about what they do within the trust. Everybody, in fact, almost everybody I've met in the trust has left a career with another organisation to go and work for the National Trust because they believe in it. So it makes it a very strange organisation to work for because even the accountants are there because they actually want to conserve stuff. Um, and, you know, that's quite, quite unique. But even here, we have to change things. We have to get people's attitudes to shift. And it can be quite hard because they don't believe in everything that we're talking about. But it's one thing to do it internally, and the relevance to the National Trust to wider communities and to, to cities right throughout the UK um, is how we engage outside of our own borders, if you like. So outside of our properties. If we go back to why the Trust was set up, which was about engaging with people so that they had this access to nature and access to fresh air, well, we think that's extremely important. Now, this is a project we ran on Brown Sea Island where we had a load of uh, sort of sixth form kids that came over onto the island for four days and did a load of, a load of I won't use the word green because it's not the right word for the occasion, but um, in this instance, we were actually mapping sea level rise around the island. So actually what they did is they went on and they, looked, they did the different projections for sea level rise and they drew a white line around the island so that you could actually see what does it really look like um, and it's practical examples of those sorts of things. You know, can you imagine someone actually coming through the centre of Bristol and painting a white line through the centre of Bristol and saying, do you know what, in 100 years, that's going to be your spring tide line. That sort of stuff. And getting kids to do that stuff is absolutely brilliant. Um, so we run through all this. We run through education. We run through trying to get people to change behaviours. And the idea is really that we get away from things being demonstration projects. We get away from technology being a draw that people want to go and see a biomass boiler. I mean, really, once you've seen one, you don't really want to see many more. Um, and what, this, is, this is the piggery building at Tinsfield. So this, this houses the biomass boiler, and everyone at Tinsfield walks past it. But actually, I think for the next five years, perhaps, there's a window where people will want to see this stuff, and they want to understand how it works. But actually, it's back of house stuff. It's, it's a boiler. It just burns something and produces heat. Not particularly exciting. Um, but, but on this one, you've also then got photovoltaic panels producing electricity, and there's a big array, a ground-mounted array behind the building as well. We've got solar thermal doing the hot water there. So you're actually trying to look at daisy-chaining technologies together. You're not just saying one technology, that's the answer. You have to look at the site, you have to understand what it needs, and then you can plug the technologies into suit. But then, once you've done it as a demonstration project, and Tinsfield was a demonstration project, you know, there was a lot of heritage lottery fund money that went into being able to do the con conservation works there. Um, but then we start to have the confidence to do it, and to do it on a small scale, and to do it at a house level, right up to a village level. So this is Philcombe Farm in West Dorset, which is the, the office on Golden Cap Estate, which, you know, is, I'd move there. It wouldn't take a lot. Um, but again, small biomass boiler photovoltaic panels, solar thermal, the, that was all paid for by fixing a water main that leaked for 20 years. Um, and the savings from fixing it paid for us to do all of that. And the, how the place is completely energy, energy neutral because all the electricity is generated there. The wood all comes from the thinnings on the, the, the rangers were actually doing the work anyway and the wood was actually being left to rot in the fields or the hedgerows. So, it is possible to move beyond demonstration project and move actually into it being the norm. Um, I think the, the beauty of this for the trust is actually we're not creating new stuff. This isn't new ideas. Our moving away from energy into the broader sustainability thing here, our ancestors were very, very clever. Our ancestors ran these estates to be very self-sufficient. They had their own water supplies. They had dealt with the sewage their own way. They generated their own energy. They grew their own food. They grew their own fuel. The people worked on the estates, lived on the estates. So they were actually, you know, there were a lot of lessons from 300, 400 years ago that actually stand very true today. And actually, we can learn an awful lot from that. But we learn from that. We learn from the past. I mean, this is a historic hydro system. But, you know, even at Tinsfield, we had a historic heat main going from the sawmill 
where they used to burn the wood and the heat was taken down to go under floor on the chapel. So there's lots of things going on there that, that actually with a bit of, I won't say digging, but, you know, a bit of uh, Phil from Time Team investigation and we're laughing, you know, we can understand what's going on. But we plan for the future um, and it is the future that we're looking at because we can't sell, we can't go bust, so we have to think about what's next. And that's just there. I didn't even set my time, so I have no idea if I was on time. Sorry. Um, thank you, Malcolm. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, does anybody have any questions? Any of the speakers? Sir, we've got a microphone. Have we got a microphone? Anyone? No. Sorry, you'll have to bellow. That, micro that microphone should work, I think. No, just push, push the on button. There we are. Well, <laughs> it's got an on-off button. First of all, I don't think you're talking about New Earth solutions of what... Thank you. Yes, it's... Um, I, I suppose I've got to be very, very careful what I say, really. Um, but for those of you who don't know... Um, Bristol City Council and the West of England Partnership have let a waste contract to us and we're doing what we're doing and we're very pleased with what we're doing and we think most people seem to be quite pleased with what we're doing. Um, but there are a couple of other plants uh, promoted um, and I'll just state the facts as I understand them, uh, which is that one of them will be receiving waste from London um, by train, I think. Um, this to me is very frustrating. Um, I'm afraid it's not the only example of this. Um, the city of Manchester used to send all of its rubbish to Scunthorpe uh, to go into a hole in the ground. The city of Bristol used to send all of its rubbish to Buckinghamshire to go into a hole in the ground until the 1st of April 2011 when we opened. So there's a lot of this about. Um, there's a project at the moment to send rubbish from Liverpool to Teesside because you can't find any brownfield land in Liverpool to build a waste facility, which I just simply don't believe. And George's opposite number, the Mayor of Liverpool, is being very vexed by this uh, at the moment. So what we have is a system where it takes an inordinate amount of time for waste contracts to go through. And in fairness to those who were promoting these other things, when they started, which was probably five or more years ago, they would have looked at people like us and said, we think you're mad and it will never work. Um, and it's taken us the time it's taken to get to where we are with the support of Bristol and, and others. Um, but not, ev not every authority around the country has, has, taken, that, uh, has taken that approach. So, um, speaking on behalf of my company and speaking personally, of course, I'm, I regret that because that's a missed opportunity for us to do something in, in, in West London. Uh, but unfortunately, it's taken a very long time to get to where it's got to. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that there's, there's much <laughs> can be done about it, to be honest, because the planning permissions exist, the environmental permits exist. Um, and the contracts exist, so um, that appears to be uh, to, to be that, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you, sir. Another one here.
thank you. I've got a question for Malcolm. Um, thank you for your um, impassioned um, and inspiring talk about what the Trust is concerned about climate change and what you're doing about it. As a member of the National Trust, I do find it hard to reconcile that with the stance you're taking on one of the largest potential renewable energy installations that we could be having in this part of the world, the Atlantic Array. Somebody who really loves the coast, uh, both from both South Wales and the North Devon side, frequently walks in that area. I really don't see why you should, where you think you'll remit, um, drives you to say that energy production has to be out of sight and out of mind. Um, oh, sorry. That's a very difficult one to answer, actually. Thanks. Um, out of sight, out of mind isn't, isn't the policy. Landscape appropriate is the policy, and it's the phrase that gets trotted out quite a lot. It's actually a very difficult thing to measure on the ground. You know, what is landscape appropriate? Um, and actually, the Trust don't make decisions about what they will or won't support lightly. Um, one of our problems is as a very big organization with a lot of experts and very passionate experts internally is that it takes an awful long time to get the trust to actually to come to a policy on something like that so there would have been a huge amount of stakeholder dialogue that took place for the trust to get to its position um, and actually the beauty of the trust is that not everybody has to agree um, and personally I wouldn't agree on that one um, with our current statement, but uh, position statement, but that's that's me as an individual, and the trust, with all of its curatorial influences, all of its land holding influences, all of its villagers, and you know, got to think about the sort of the communities that our ownership supports as well, have taken a wide view, and that's the the current position they've taken. That sounds like me dodging, perhaps I don't know, but uh, it's it's a difficult one to explain. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Sir? Believe it or not, I think you're probably talking to a relatively green audience. But if we weren't, how would you persuade us of the benefit of eco-innovation? Is that something for everyone? Yeah. Okay, let's have a quick, a quick run along the table then. Start with David. <laughs> Sorry, David. <laughs> How about, have you got grandchildren? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I think one of the other things that we look at is um, the fact that the UK lost an opportunity 20 years ago with, the, with, um, on, with wind turbines, and they were the world leaders in wind turbine technology. And um, lack of government support for wind turbine technology 20 years ago, all of that technology went abroad and was actually manufactured by other companies in other countries. We now have the opportunity to do what we missed 20 years ago with tidal technology in the UK, and that's to create jobs, create technologies which can actually be deployed worldwide, and actually, are sustain actually do generate an electricity sustainably. Thank you. Ruth. Well, I think probably from, from Wessex Water's perspective, um, Innovation is very important to us because we're faced with sort of current economic conditions where customers don't obviously want to see their water bills rising. Yet, on the other hand, we've got European standards which require us to do increasingly more in terms of treatment of both wastewater and and uh, drinking water. And we need to we need to do something different. We can't build our way out of our current situation, so we need to innovate. Thank you, Richard. Well, I suppose for me, um, if, if people in here weren't green and they were just wanting to make as much money as possible, I mean, there are so many of the environmental innovations that will make people money. If uh, you're talking about packaging and you make packaging that costs less and then can be recycled better, uh, we know from um, you know, new light bulbs and all those sorts of things that people can uh, save a lot of money. And indeed, if you, a lot of innovation is just recycling old ideas, actually, and uh, certainly some of the upstream thinking where you get uh, farmers to start blocking some of the um, mires on, on, or the gullies on the mires and the moors and keep the water up in the peat bogs as it used to be. 
um, then stops uh, flooding, it keeps water there for water resources, and it purifies water and more peat grows. I mean, it's, it's not exactly new technology, but it's not half work. Thank you. Robert. Um, I do a lot of government relations, and speaking to government until a few years ago, the environment was number one, uh, droughts were number two, UK balance of trade was number three, and that's probably about it, really. Uh, then a thing called the financial crisis happened in 2008, and in order to preserve the renewables obligation to look at what's happening with electricity market reform and to preserve our landfill tax, uh, which is one of the drivers for our business, we just turned that round. So we still talk about the environment and we still talk about climate change, uh, but it's about number four on the list now, and the politicians listen when you talk about jobs, because we employ people, we're building a low carbon industry here in Bristol. They listen when you say we're going to take this technology, we're going to sell it worldwide, unlike what happened with wind turbines in the 1990s, where we built one factory on the Isle of Wight and then it closed down. Um, and we're going to be helping the local economy recover, and we're going to be building an, a, 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 an economy that isn't based on flogging people financial things that they don't need. Thank you. Malcolm. Hmm. Um, I'd love to give you a nice fluffy answer, actually, that, you know, it's the right thing to do. But um, actually, it's, it's more fundamental than that. The, our, society, our entire society currently, and the National Trust business model currently, is based on one thing, which is oil. We're running out of oil. We haven't got much left. And at the end of the day, we need to cope with what comes next, because there is a next. Things don't just end. Um, and by looking at houses, looking at each one of our lives, if we, the, the study that I mentioned earlier in the Independent today, DEC are now saying that by shifting your energy performance rating on your house by two points, it can add £16,500 to the value of your home. Now, that's a fundamental driver for insulating your loft at, you know, not much money, isn't it? Um, if we look at oil price quadrupling, doubling to quadrupling over the next five to ten years, how on earth are we going to cope with the bills for houses and things? So it comes down to pounds and pence. Thank you. Thank you all. Any more questions? Blimey. Okay, so. How, how, can, how can we bring about a change in the, in the three main par, par, parties in, in, the, in, the, in the policy towards him? Privatisation of com companies for profit, like water companies, gas, electric, transport, and, and, and even with, with ha housing, where we get housing being very expensive and, and not enough cheap, cheap, cheap rented property in, in the housing sector. And, 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 and that is not being a, a, a green policy. And so how do we go about changing things? Okay, Ruth, perhaps you'd like to defend privatisation of uh, water. Um, well, yes, Wessex Water is a private company. Our shareholder does want to return. But at the same time, a lot of our funding does come through our customers. And um, I think there was, there was some articles in the paper recently from Thames Water, the level of debt for, for Thames Water customer has, has spiralled such that it adds £93 onto every single customer's bill. The same is true in the Wessex Water region, although not quite to the same level, thankfully. But even so, our customers do have to pay their, their water bills. We need, we need their income to survive. It's all part of our, our sort of goal of sustainability. We have to have everything in, in alignment, the, envir the environment, economics, um, and also obviously the people working for the company as well. So we need to get those in balance in order to to um, be be sustainable and. Continue. So are you saying it's better for the customer? Pardon? Are you saying it's better for the customer to be privatised? I, I think probably the level of investment which we have seen and the environmental improvements as a result of privatisation have been huge and much needed at the time when privatisation occurred. I mean, since 1995, we spent £335 million improving the sewerage system within Bristol. I don't know that you would have got that through a nationalised industry. OK, thank you. So you had a question? The cameraman. <laughs> 
Um, it sort of follows on from that, actually. I've been reading quite a lot about, uh, there's a movement to, called the Commons Movement, which is sort of gaining a bit of momentum in um, different areas, in, academically and, and on the ground. And it argues that certain, certain resources should be held in common for the benefit of, uh, for the benefit of the planet, for people. And it's, it's interesting that the drivers that were talked about, you were saying earlier about jobs and things like this, but actually it doesn't seem like there are many jobs and actually with more automation come in and, and machines taking on these roles I just wonder where where are people and social justice if you talk about sustainability you, I think you've got to talk about social justice and at the moment we you know we're seeing a massive increase in inequality in this country driven mainly by the ideological austerity agenda of this government but I can't you know as being a panel based on a lot of infrastructure uh, services, how, how can you reconcile like fuel poverty and things like this with, with profit making when the situation is where people aren't going to have money to pay for these things and there isn't going to be um, jobs. Okay. There isn't jobs. I mean, we're seeing rise right. rising unemployment. So thank you. Um, Robert, you, tensions. Robert, you talked about having very few people in your plants. Um, how do you square that with running what is a sustainable business? Well, we have one person whose job is to physically pick plastic contamination out of ferrous metal uh, on a conveyor belt. But he, I say he, it's on a shift. Um, so there are, in fact, four of them um, work to cover 24 hours a day. Um, that person is one of 80 people that we employ in total at uh, our waste plant. And we've got about another 20 or 30 that we employ at the energy plant. Um, I can't speak with absolute certainty, but I'm pretty sure that's more than we're employed in the old system of, of burying it in a hole in the ground. So um, I think we are increasing employment. Um, I mentioned, and I mean it quite seriously, we don't ever have problems with recruiting people to do we run a rubbish plant and we're asking people to run machines and to pick through garbage. Uh, but there is plenty of people queuing up for that kind of work. So um, we're quite happy to provide it with a living wage um, on, 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 on that basis. Talking about public ownership, it's a con continuous ideological discussion about do you bring private capital in to do things that should otherwise be on the, on the national debt, on the, on, the, on the public account, is private capital more efficient? Are there things that shouldn't be in the public sec private sector? I don't know. The thing that I'm quite interested in at the moment is district heating. We've got a massive opportunity at the back of our plant to heat a large area of Bristol. Um, I don't know what the model for doing that is, but I suspect that it probably involves a lot of public sector involvement and it's something that maybe the private sector can't do on its own. Okay. Well, I think we can take... Oh, sorry. Um, did you want to say something? Apologies. Yeah. You well, I, I just thought this is quite an interesting area generally, I think, in terms of trying to get uh, uh, systems of production, and I'm, obviously my expertise is food, uh, that are fair for the people that are producing it and fair for people who are buying and eating it. And, uh, and you know, just starting off with the jobs thing, I mean, we, we do tend to find that you have a lot more jobs on organic farms um, because we're not quite so automated in many areas, but it can be quite tricky uh, to find people who want to work close to the land these days. I mean, we, we, we're often really struggling to find the next generation of people or to find the opportunities for them to, to learn about growing. A lot of people want to do it, but actually finding their way in and finding the access to land uh, is a real challenge, I think, uh, in society today. And that's where some of the debates you're raising about the ownership model um, and uh, how do you actually develop uh, those opportunities, uh, that access uh, that gives people a step on the ladder, I think is a, is, is a real challenge. And there's a fundamental challenge, too, around the fairness 
uh, in our food system? How do you make sure that farmers uh, don't have to get bigger and bigger and bigger in order to be, to be able to earn a living? How do you make sure they can afford to pay, pay people a decent wage? Um, but also making sure that food gets through to the final customer at a price they can afford to pay too and that's healthy and fair to them. So these are really big questions. I mean, we could have a whole evening uh, based on your question. Um, but it's, okay. uh, it's one that I think we're all really struggling with and at the Soil Association really trying to get right. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Richard, um, yeah. last comment from you. Should have, oh, and maybe we should have a whole evening on it because you can't talk about environmental improvement without talking about uh, social equality and without talking about then where you get the money from to pay for that. So I think it's really important that we talk about, about these issues. But just to give you the example of what I was talking about with caring about our uh, water environment, for instance, one of the things is how do we, I'm sure many of you in the room are, you know, interested in that, but what about all the people who aren't in the room who just feel disenfranchised from, from this debate and how do we get people, we've got to give them enough information to make them engaged in it and, and so many people feel left out of being able to join in these debates because they don't feel that they have the information. Uh, whether, it's, whether it's objecting to a, uh, an incineration plant, whatever your views on these things, we need to make it easier for, for, for communities to really engage and understand and then come to proper decisions about their own locality. Thank you. And we're going to take one more question from the lady at the back there. Hi there, my name's Penny Fiddler. I run a national charity that's based in Bristol that works with science and discovery and engagement with science and discovery. Um, my question's about tidal. It's fantastic to see we have so much expertise in Bristol about, in the field of tidal. And we've also got a 13 metre tidal range up into the city centre, or almost the city centre. And I just wondered what the opportunities were in terms of generation from power actually within the city centre of Bristol. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Just working. Um, I'm going to have to. Uh, our technology is is fundamentally free stream tidal, where we actually extract energy from the currents. I mean, there are schemes where you can um, extract energy from low head hydro, such as um, the Rance in France or the. Um, Bay of, well, I'm trying to think what the one in the Bay of Fundy is now. Um, yeah, but there is a smaller one, a one megawatt one in the Bay of Fundy as well. Um, but. Um, and we have about, I think it's about eight or nine metres range in the Bristol Channel. So theoretically, it should be achievable. Um, but I don't think anybody, to my knowledge, has actually looked at what they can actually get out of the, um, the Avon Gorge. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Thanks for all your questions. Thanks very much for coming tonight. It's been a very interesting evening for me. I've spent the evening watching you, actually, because not being able to turn around and watch the screen. And I've seen a lot of very different facial expressions, I have to say. But... When Malcolm put his, up his picture of scenery, of landscape, every, everyone in the room smiled. It was quite extraordinary, actually. That probably tells us all we need to know. Um, I want to thank the speakers for, for coming tonight. They've given some great insight into some of the environmental issues that face their businesses um, and how Bristol plays such an important role in them. But I don't think I'll ever eat chocolate milkshake again. Thank you. Thank you.